All right, well, good evening, everybody. Appreciate everybody coming out in the midst of this cold weather. I mean, it's only cold for us in Texas. The rest of the country, it's normal weather, right? <laughs> but if you have a copy of your Bible this evening, open it, if you could, to the book of James. Chapter 1 and verse 19. And as you know, we've been um, working our way recently through the book of James. James, as you know, is the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is writing to the scattered Hebrew Christian flock in the diaspora. And his primary issue or primary concern is uh, practical righteousness. In other words, how do we please God in daily life? Our position is already pleasing to him. But how do we let our practice catch up with our position? So James is a favorite of a lot of people because it's probably one of the most practical, other than the book of Proverbs, it's probably one of the most hands-on, tangible, uh, practical books of the Bible that you could study. So the first half of the book is about faith, not about saving faith, but what? Serving, serving faith, yeah. So how do we walk in faith? Well, one way to do it is to adopt God's perspective on suffering. So he begins there with the whole subject of trials. That's how you can discern if you're walking in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. You have the mind of God on suffering. And what we learned in that section, which we completed last week, is in the midst of trials, we are to rejoice. And James gave us three reasons to do that. And that's verses 2 through 12. And as we are walking through trials, we should resist the temptation to charge God recklessly or foolishly. Or sort of make it sound, you know, as if God is trying to destroy us. And so James gave us three reasons why we shouldn't charge God with trying to tempt us or destroy us in the midst of trials. So having completed that, and I hate to say completed that because I don't know if we ever completely learned that lesson. Amen. Um, when we completed the verses, but that's like a lifelong thing to learn, isn't it, as a Christian? So better said, having finished that section, now we're moving into verses 19 through 27, where we manifest a practical righteousness that pleases God when we obey God's word. So to obey God's word, we have three needs. Number one, we have a need to be slow in speaking and anger, verses 19 and 20. Ouch, that one hurts. Because that, that's the opposite of how we are, isn't it? We're quick to speak and quick to get upset. But James there in verses 19 and 20 says we ought to be the opposite of that. Number two, we have a need for obedience to God's word. That's probably the central part of it. Verses 21 through 25. And then number three, we need, we have a need, third need we have is to practice true religion. And maybe religion is not the best choice of words. Maybe the better choice of words would be piety. You know, if someone is really walking with the Lord, what does their life look like in practical terms? So... I don't know, maybe we'll finish this tonight, I'm not sure, but we'll see how far we can get. But we may not get beyond verses 19 and 20. The Holy Spirit might keep us there for a while. I know the Holy Spirit's kept me there for a while as I've been trying to study and prepare, prepare for this. 
So, verses 19 and 20, we have a need to be slow in speaking and in anger. So, slowness of speech, first part of 19, verse 19. Slowness in anger, second part of verse 19 into verse 20. But notice how we are to be slow to speak. Uh, Look at verse 19 of James 1. It says, this you know, and I'm not sure we do know this, but his audience knew it, probably through James' pastoral ministry or probably through their Hebrew study of the Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is filled with this kind of thing about not being rash, you know, not being a person of many words, um, not being a person that's emotionally driven. So he says, this you know, my beloved brethren. Now it's very clear, verse 19, that the audience is saved. No doubt about it. Because it doesn't just say brethren, which would be enough proof as far as I'm concerned. But you could argue, well, James is just kind of, you know, the same Jewish kinship as his audience. So that's how some define brethren. But you'll notice it doesn't just say brethren, it says beloved brethren. So I would challenge anybody to find any passage anywhere in the Bible where beloved brethren means something other than a believer. I mean, as far as I know, that language never applies to a non-Christian. A non-Christian is not a brother. They're a fellow image bearer of God, but they're not a brother in Christ. And they certainly are not beloved. They're loved by God, but they're not the way the term is used in a relationship with God. So very clearly he's speaking to Christians here. So this is um, something that is only capable of being carried out by the power of the Holy Spirit. An unsaved person can never be this way. Slow to speak, slow to, to get angry. So he continues on here, verse 19, and he says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear and slow to speak. It's like what your mom told you or what my mom told me growing up. You have two ears and one mouth, and so you should <laughs> you should use those in proportion. Was anybody's mom tell him that, or am I the only one? Okay. We suffer from a like ailment, I guess. And, you know, a lot of people, they spend a lot of their time in apologetics trying to figure out, is the Bible, let's, let's prove that the Bible's from God kind of thing. Let's come up with all these intellectual arguments. I mean, to me, there's no doubt that the Bible is God's word based on statements like that because it's so foreign to the way we are. So you get the idea that God outside of time knows our sinful tendencies, And he speaks right against those sinful tendencies. I know of no other book on planet Earth which, you know, as Hebrews 4.12 says, with the sword, which is the word living and active, separating soul and spirit, laying us bare like this. I know of no other book that does this. So it's got to be from God. That's my apologetics. So we must be quick to hear, slow to speak. And of course, this is totally contrary to 21st century America, where we, through social media and blogs and tweeting and posting and texting, have the ability to take our carnal thoughts and export them to the whole world in half a second. So you look at the social media world and everybody's trying to get in the last word. Everybody's trying to talk. Everybody's trying to have their say. And 21st century America obviously is not, this this idea of being slow to speak, quick to hear uh, is contrary to that. So we are in the United States, a talker nation. I mean, we value people based on how they can talk. And usually the person that's loudest in the room, you know, ends up winning the argument. We have talk shows where the whole industry revolves around talking. 
I mean, talk, 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 talk. And uh, James, you know, says the exact opposite. You know, we ought to be quick to hear and slow to speak. Now, once we move away from this, don't celebrate because we're going to get to verse, um, oh, what is it, 26, 27, excuse me, which is going to teach us the same thing. And then we're going to get to the big whammy. You guys know where the big whammy is, right, in James? It's James 3, 1 through 12, where he's going to go on for 12 verses about this two-by-two slab of mucous membrane between my gums called the tongue. So this is just a little introductory thought here that he's giving us about being quick to hear and slow to speak. By the way, I was thinking about this, and doesn't that describe Jesus? Quick to hear and slow to speak? Um, the prophet Isaiah, 700 years in advance about Jesus, says this. Uh, in other words, this is how you're going to be able to recognize your, your Messiah, you Jewish people, when he shows up 700 years later. It says, he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. And it's interesting that when you look at the fulfillment of that prophecy, he was silent at the time when most of us would be the loudest because he was being accused unfairly. I mean, if there's ever a time to run your mouth, that's the time, right? And yet Jesus was in that way, as is predicted by Isaiah because in Matthew 27, verses 12 to 14, it says, but, but when the lead, this is at one of the religious trials of Jesus, it says, but when the leading priests and the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Verse 13, don't you hear all these, it, it, it's sort of the, pre, the high priest now is upset. Defend yourself. Don't you hear all of these charges that are, that are being brought or they are bringing against you? Pilate demanded. I'm sorry, that was not the high priest. That was Pilate. But Jesus made no response to any of these charges. And then it says, much to the governor's surprise. So everybody couldn't believe how quiet he was at a time when most human beings would be the loudest. And this is, you know, James, of course, knew Jesus very well. He was Christ's half-brother. And I think, you know, this is the kind of thing that James is talking about, being slow to speak. I'm not obviously against people defending themselves, but I think a lot of times we can go too far, amen, with the, the talking. And uh, James is being, you know, he's, he knew Christ's character, and he, I think he's thinking of Christ, you know, be slow to speak and quick to hear. And I look at a lot of the things that we, we do, and I put myself into this. You know, we want to get on the radio. Um, we want to start a Facebook page. We want to start a blog. We want to start a YouTube channel. We want to get our point of view out. And I'm, I'm just, I to be honest with you, I'm wondering if Jesus if he was alive on the earth today, what he'd be doing? I mean, would Jesus be like a radio talk show host? I mean, maybe he would, and I could be completely wrong. It just seems to me so contrary to who he was and all of the things that we think are so important in terms of speech and talking all of the time. Um, well, enough of that. That's too convicting. But... Don't celebrate yet, because what's coming is actually a little bit more difficult to absorb. Not only should we be slow to speak, but we should be slow to get angry. Oh my goodness. Verse 19. This you know, my beloved brethren, everyone must be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. Uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 31, Paul would write, 
let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander, which arise from anger, be put away from you along with all malice. So your Bible has a lot to say about anger or acting out in a moment of being upset about something. Uh, one such example is Moses. I mean, Moses, I think, was doing pretty well as God's representative, as he led the children of Israel out of Egypt and down to Mount Sinai there at the, the dot at the bottom or the circle at the bottom, if that's the traditional location of Mount Sinai. And then up, they, were, they had an 11-day journey into Canaan. You'll find that 11, uh, did I say 11 year, 11 day journey into Canaan. You'll find that number in Deuteronomy chapter one, around verse two and verse five, right in there. And so Moses, along with that whole generation was on a fast track to entering Canaan. Until what? What did Moses do that prevented him from entering Canaan? Anybody remember? He struck the rock. And that story is recorded in Numbers 20, verses 8 through 13, which says, God speaking, take the staff, you and your brother Aaron, and assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes that it shall yield its water. So you shall bring water for them out of the rock and have the congregation and their livestock drink. So Moses took the staff and he's dealing with people, probably if the numbers are literal and I, I take them literally, probably a million people, maybe a million and a half people. I mean, that's quite a, that's quite a job there. Yeah. Plus the cattle and everything else. Um, he's supposed to take them into the promised land and they've had all these problems that God has answered. The water problem's already been answered elsewhere earlier. The hunger problem has been answered through manna. So once again, this same group, you know, is out there in the Sinai Peninsula and there's no water and they're getting upset. And Moses, I think, has had just about enough of it, of these people. It says, so you shall bring water for them out of the rock and have the congregation and their livestock drink. So Moses took the staff from before the Lord, just as he, is command, as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron assemb, uh, uh, summoned the assembly in front of the rock. And he said to them, <laughs> this is where you can sort of read into how he was getting upset. Listen now, you rebels. Now, <laughs> did God ever say, okay, Moses, when you do this, I want you to call them all rebels. So he's, I think he's acting in his own flesh here, Moses is. Listen now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. God said, speak to the rock, as far as I can tell, once. And here he hit the rock twice. So he, I think he, he, he lost his cool. I mean, maybe I'm reading a little too much into it, but that's my loose paraphrase. So when I come out with my own Bible paraphrase, it'll say Moses lost his cool. And water, notice how God honored their need and fulfilled it anyway despite Moses, water came out abundantly and the congregation and the livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, so now God is confronting Moses on what he's just done, which Moses probably thought, no problem. The water came forth. Since you did not trust in me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, for that reason, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. And then the story concludes and it says, these were called the waters of Meribah because the sons of Israel argued with the Lord and he proved himself holy among them. So you've got Moses who has been faithful and you've got one 
uh, moment of anger here. And it's not that Moses went to hell. He couldn't have gone to hell because you can't lose your salvation. And he's with the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew uh, 17. But he lost a privilege that he could have had. He could have entered into Canaan. And that privilege was denied to him. And so the story of Moses ends with him uh, on Mount Nebo, uh, basically looking at Canaan from a distance. So, you know, you look at this and you say, well, why didn't God just cut him a break? I mean, he'd been faithful every other time. Well, there's a lot of reasons why God did not cut him a break. For one thing, this is typological of Christ. And God doesn't want that typology messed up in any way. I think that was one of the reasons that God was kind of strict with Moses. And we could go on a long sermon over that, which I won't bore you with. But, you know, you can find that thinking in a lot of commentators. But it also shows what God actually feels about us in a moment of just fleshliness, just losing it and sort of publicly acting out, particularly as a leader. Uh, apparently, God doesn't like that. And it is interesting that you can spend your lifetime building your reputation. And you could destroy it in about 30 seconds. Just by kind of unrestrained anger. My father, my dad, used to always tell me, he explained anger this way. He says, anger is like temporary insanity. You say things you would never say when you're angry. And so, or you do things you would never do when you're angry. It's like being insane for just a moment. And so that's why we're told about being, being careful about being quick to be becoming upset. Being quick to lose one's temper. Um, and this is the kind of thing that James is dealing with here when he talks about be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, why is that, James? He gives us an explanation there in verse 20. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So you cannot fulfill God's design for your life living off the energy of bitterness or anger. Anger can be sort of a powerful thing in the sense that it can motivate you for a season. Um, but the reality is that sort of walk is not at all the walk of the Spirit, which the New Testament tells us about. In fact, that's actually a work of the flesh. The works of the flesh are the ways that the sin nature tangibly manifests itself. And we have a laundry list of such things in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. How do you know when the flesh or the sin nature is rearing its ugly head in our lives as Christians? Well, this is how we act. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, and there it is, outbursts of anger, temper tantrums, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things, things like these, in other words, Paul says, I could give you more, but I won't. Of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, what does that mean? They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Does that mean if I get angry, I'm not going to heaven? No. In all of these vice lists, there's a switch from the second person to the third person. There's about four or five of these vice lists in the New Testament. You'll notice even here, it said, he, he goes, which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, second person, verse 21, that those, see the switch there? 
He just went from second person to the third person. Those that practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, that's how unbelievers act. And unbelievers are going to a totally different destination than where you're going as a Christian. So why would we imitate unbelievers? That's his point. He's not trying to make some great point here about maybe you're going to lose your salvation or maybe you never had salvation, uh, etc. But it's still very clear that um, outbursts of anger is a work of the sin nature. Now, it's interesting, you, you hear a lot of people how they justify the fact that they have a short fuse. They'll say, well, I'm Irish. Or I'm German. Or I'm Italian. Or I have red hair. As if people who don't have red hair don't get upset. No, it's not. A, maybe you are Irish, German, Italian. Maybe you do have red hair. But if, if this is a perpetual issue in our lives, what the Bible is saying is we're carnal. It's carnality. It's, we keep going back to the sin nature is what the issue is. So this is why James is saying, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now notice this, it says the anger of man. All anger isn't wrong because Jesus got angry. Did you know that? I could show you chapter and verse where God gets angry. Uh, jot down Psalm 2 verse 12 which of Christ says, kiss the son that he may not be angry and you perish on the way. And then a New Testament example of Christ is in Mark 3 verse 5. After looking around at them with anger, that's Jesus. Yeah, and the, the two temple cleansings would be an example also of that. So I kind of find it interesting that James here uses the expression anger of man. And there's a big difference between anger of man and anger of God. Uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 says, Be angry and yet do not sin. So apparently there is anger that a person can experience that's not sinful. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is when you're angry concerning a righteous anger, you're angry because of God's character that's being violated. When you're angry and you, and you experience the anger of man, usually what the case is, is, you, is you're trying to vindicate yourself. And it's easy to confuse the two. And sometimes righteous indignation can lead very quickly into the anger of man. And so we have to watch that very carefully. And this is why the scripture tells us in places like Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, that we should forgive as we have been forgiven. Because all of us in living in a fallen world have been mistreated by somebody. And if you don't forgive them as you've been forgiven, the only thing that's going to happen is that venom is just going to get bottled up inside of us and eventually it's going to spill out. And so we need to be people that forgive quickly. And you say, well, they don't deserve it. Well, that's true. They don't deserve it. But you don't, you don't deserve to be forgiven either, right? By Jesus. Either do I. So it's interesting that we treat other people with justice when God has treated us with grace. In fact, in Matthew 18, there's a whole parable about that. It shows us how, how silly we look uh, about the guy, you know, that uh, was forgiven a few pennies and he found another guy, you know, that uh, I may have that wrong. But anyway, you guys can read that. You guys can read that. That's not in my notes. You can read that for yourself. Matthew 18, there's a whole story about how silly we look when we as forgiven people aren't forgiving in return. So it is interesting that James uses the expression anger of man. And this issue of being slow to speak, now some people interpret that as, okay, well, I'm going to get a piece of duct tape, put it over my mouth, and I'm never going to say a single word. And that's not what the Bible is saying either. 
the Bible promotes speech in many places. For example, in 1 Peter 4, 11, it says, whoever speaks is to do so as the one who is speaking the utterances of God or the oracles of God. So obviously you can't just say, well, I'm just not going to talk. Uh, that's not what the Bible's saying either. God gave us speech and communication as a gift from him. What he's saying is in our sinful condition, when it comes to hearing and speaking, we ought to be quick to hear and slow to speak. Be guarded about speaking. Be reserved about speaking. And don't speak when you're in a moment of temporary insanity, such as an outburst of anger. And if anger continues to be a problem in our lives, then really what the issue is a lot of times is we're just, um, we're holding people to a standard of justice when we've been treated with grace. See that? You start treating people with grace. And by the way, just because you forgive somebody, I'm not suggesting that you put yourself back in harm's way. <laughs> uh, the Bible doesn't promote that either. But when we are treated with injustice, treat them, at least in the arena of your mind and thoughts, the way God treats you. And as you do that, what you'll see is your level of antagonism and anger and outbursts of anger, and these things will start to decrease. Uh, I'm not saying we'll be perfect, but you'll see a marked decrease in those things. And so this is what uh, James is dealing with. So we should just end right there, right? That's pretty heavy stuff. But we won't. We'll go on to verses 21 through 25. So how do we obey God? We have, a, we have three needs. Our first need is to be slow in speaking and slow in anger. Second need we have is we have a need to obey God's word. And the first thing he deals with is receiving God's word. Verse 21. After he talks about receiving God's word, verse 21, then he talks about being a doer of God's word. Verses 22 through 25. Why the order? Because you can't do what you don't know, right? Right? And you'll notice here that receiving God's word is only a first step. It's an important step, but it was never intended by God to be a last step. Receiving and understanding God's word needs to translate into obedience to God's word if we're going to allow our practice as Christians to catch up with our position. So how do we receive God's word? Three R's. Ready? I'm almost becoming a Baptist here with my alliterations. And I love my Baptist friends. I just want to be clear about that because I don't want them angry at me. Amen. First R, removal. These are all in verse 21. Second R, reception. Also in verse 21. Third R, result. Also in verse 21. So he's dealing with receiving God's word, three R's, before we do God's word, verses 22 through 25. So what do I need to do to receive God's word? The first thing I have to do is I have to remove something. So notice, if you will, verse 21. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. So first R is removal. And it's right there at the beginning of verse 21. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. So before I receive God's word, if it's going to have the effect on me that it needs to have to its highest level, I need to put aside certain sins, all sins really. Filthiness and wickedness. Because filthiness and wickedness are appetite suppressants. 
So my wife makes me a very nutritious meal. And before I get home, I go through McDonald's and I get my quarter pounder, fries, chocolate shake. Large, supersize me, right? So supersize that. So I eat all this junk and I get home and here comes the nutritious meal and it's just really not, I don't really have an interest in it. See that? That's what filthiness and wickedness do to the people of God and their appetite for God's word. If those things are habitual, consistent patterns in our lives, we, I mean, we're not going to go to Bible study on Wednesday night. Uh, I'm not going to go to church. You, you mean you guys teach like a Sunday school class and you teach a sermon? I mean, what is wrong with you people? Don't you know this is Texas and we've got football and all this stuff? Um, you, you know, you, you start making excuses as to why you won't take in God's word. And generally, it has to do with things that we've allowed into our lives that are suppressing the appetite. The appetite isn't there because we've inhaled a bunch of things that aren't nutritious for us. There is a parallel passage in 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2, you know what I mean by a parallel passage, different author, same idea. And it's in 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2, and it says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Those are the appetite suppressants, those five things. And, continues on, verse 2, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word so that you may grow in respect to salvation. So the Christian is supposed to be fixated almost like a newborn child on God's word so that they can grow. If you remove the mother's milk from the growing child, the child is malnourished. See that? So, and what prevents the child from being malnourished is the child will wake up in the middle of the night screaming their head off, as my daughter did. And she wasn't interested at that age in a lecture on the Trinity. She wanted to be fed. So I said to my wife, this calls for you. I'm going back to bed. So she's dealing with some unforgiveness issues. No, I'm just, just joking. <laughs> and um, you guys heard that sigh over there. Um, yes. <laughs> so I don't know where I was. <laughs> Removing appetite suppressants. That's the point. So you, you hear a lot of people, you know, they kind of complain about their church. Not that anybody here does that. You guys would never do that, right? Yeah. No. But you hear a lot of people complain about their church and they say, oh, I just, I don't like so-and-so's teaching. I don't get much out of it. You know, you hear these kind of comments from people. And they want to blame everything on the preacher or the teacher or the presentation. When the Bible is saying, if you're kind of bored with your church or tired of your pastor or your Bible teacher, maybe there's some, maybe it's your own fault because there's something you're, you've allowed into your life which is suppressing the appetite for truth. See that? So it changes the focus off the man behind the pulpit to what's going on in our personal lives. So the first R is to remove. You can't receive until you remove. Second R is then to receive God's word. So look what it says there in verse 21. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains in wickedness, in humility, you should underline that, in humility, receive the word implanted. So you'll notice that a person cannot receive the word until they're in a position of humility. Anytime you're allowing something to teach you, whether reading the Bible for yourself, you're humbling yourself. 
Because you're coming to God and you're saying, I don't have all the answers. I need your insight. I need your illumination in my life. That requires humility. Whenever you sit under any Bible, any teacher, forget the Bible part, whether it's college or some kind of seminar you have to do at work or listening to your mentor at work or whatever. And if you're actively listening to that person, you're humbling yourself because you're acknowledging that you don't have all the answers and that you need them. So there have been, and I'm not picking on any particular person because the people I'm all thinking of, thankfully, are not here at this church anymore. (laughs) But there have been, I've been here 10 years, there have been people that have come through our doors who really, uh, you get around them and you listen to things that they're saying, they're really not all that interested in hearing any teaching from God's word. What they're interested in is promoting something or advocating something. Or, you know, when it comes to question time or discussions, they just want to grab the microphone and thunder away. And uh, it's really all about, you know, what they want to promote. They're looking for a platform. That, that is not the humility that James is talking about. A lot of people look at the life of the church as if it's kind of a talk show where we all have a say and we're all equal. And that's not what the life of the church is. That's not what Sugarland Bible Church is. This church has a leadership structure. Uh, there are people here in leadership that we believe have the gift of teaching and they're there to be listened to. Not that they're perfect, not that they're unaccountable, but to have that even that mindset of wanting to come and and be equipped by somebody else requires attitudinal humility. And that type of um, ecclesiastical structure really doesn't fit with modern day America where everybody thinks they, they know everything. Everybody thinks they're the expert on everything, including this subject here, spirituality. And so they come wanting to advocate. They come wanting to promote. They come wanting to dominate. And that's not what James is talking about. He says, when you receive God's word, you need to do it in humility. Now, there are other people that are just tired of the church and they disconnect themselves from the church because they say, I have Jesus and I have the Holy Spirit. I don't need anything else. I don't need anybody else. I don't need a a pastor. That too is really, when you get down beneath the surface of that, that's just pride is what it is. Because God has put us into a body And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, one part of the body can't say to the other part of the body, I don't need you. I mean, if all of a sudden my thumb just says, I don't need anybody else, I'm going to go off and do my own thing. I mean, that would be unthinkable, wouldn't it? And that's what a lot of people are like in Christianity, sadly. Um, And that's one of the reasons you have sort of a declining, everybody's trying to figure out, You know, in North America, if you look at the statistics, church attendance has dropped overall throughout the generations, and everybody's trying to figure out why. And really, it has to do with the lack of humility, to be honest with you. It has to do with a lot of pride in people, where they just don't want to sit under really somebody else. And so here, uh, James is saying, when you receive the word, you have to, number one, Remove appetite suppressants. And number two, you have to receive it in a place of humility. And then, well, why do this, James? Because he gives us the result. That's why. Why should I avail myself to the the teaching of God's word? James gives the result. The third R, verse 21 In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able, in other words, the word of God is able to do something for you, which is able to save your souls. So we talk a lot here in our church about the three tenses of salvation, right? You guys are familiar with this. 
Justification, past tense of salvation. Sanctification, middle tense of salvation. Glorification, future tense of salvation. Justification, saved from sin's penalty at the point of faith alone in Christ alone. Sanctification, being gradually delivered from sin's power as we live our Christian lives. And glorification, when my body is in a resurrected state with no sin nature in it at all, I'll be saved from sin's very presence at the point of death or the rapture. And you'll notice that the word of God is central to justification and sanctification. Without the word of God, neither justification nor sanctification can occur. And I gave you a few quotes on that last time. You remember the man who died and wanted to go back and warn his five brothers. Remember that? Remember the response given to him? Yeah, <laughs> yeah they have Moses and the prophets. Let them read them. If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, in other words, if they won't listen to God's word, they're not going to believe a miracle. So God has designed salvation in such a way that you cannot have it unless you hear his word and respond to his word. It's not oratory that saves you. It's not the speaking style of the guy behind the microphone that saves you. It is God's word by the design of God. 1 Peter 1.23 says, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, speaking of God's word, that through the living and enduring word of God. So you've been born again, Peter says, by the word of God. You know Romans 10.17, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of, word of God, or my translation anyway says word of Christ, but same thing, right? You remember when um, Paul was talking to Timothy about the scriptures? He says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 verse 15, and that from childhood or really infancy, you've known the sacred writings, those are the scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So without God's word, either hearing it proclaimed or like so many of those um, Bibles in the hotels, groups put Bibles in there, the Gideons, for example. And there are many, many testimonies of people that are sort of at their end of life uh, in terms of frustration and they're ready to commit suicide or something. And sort of as a last resort, they start reading out of the Bible and they get saved. So a salvation can't occur without God's word. You can't philosophize people into salvation. God has designed salvation in such a way that you hear the word, you know, the right sections about the gospel, of course, and then you respond to it by way of faith. This is why we should follow the first two R's, why we should remove and why we should receive because there is a result. What is the result? The word of God is capable of saving your soul. Now, having said all that, I don't think James is really focused here on justification because his audience is already saved. He's focused on what? Sanctification. You can't grow in Christ without God's word. It's impossible. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I have treasured your word in my heart so that I might not what? Sin against you. So what's going to keep me back from sin? It's the word of God that I've tucked into my heart that's recalled at the right time. Now, if that, that hasn't happened to a person and they haven't tucked certain scriptures into their heart, then how are they going to, how would you ever be able to stand up to temptation? How would you even know what temptation is? Unless you have the Bible. I read to you 2 Timothy 3.15, but what about verse 16? All scripture is inspired by God and beneficial. 
For what? For teaching, rebuke, correction, training in righteousness. That's growth. So no word of God. What can't happen in the life of a child of God? They can't be taught. They can't be rebuked. They can't be corrected. They can't be trained. So as I'm growing in the middle tense of my salvation, my soul is being saved because I'm learning to say no to sin. And learning to say no to sin is quite important because Romans 6 verse 23, the wages of sin is what? Death. Now that's true for the non-Christian and the Christian. If you, we allow habitual sin into our lives, whatever it is, you may not lose your salvation, but you're going to lose out on an awful lot of stuff, just like Moses forfeited Canaan, although he went to heaven. So James, in that sense, says the reason you should remove, the reason you should receive is because of this result. The result is the saving of your soul. Just as the word of God was instrumental in your justification, it's now equally instrumental in your sanctification. And so I think that's how James is using the word save. What I just said there is a big deal because of James 2 verse 14, which we haven't gotten to yet, which is one of the most controversial paragraphs the Greeks called paragraphs pericopes. I paid a lot of tuition money to learn these fancy words, so I got to use them on somebody. Pericope is just a Greek's way of saying a paragraph. So when you're around people and you say, well, let's look at the next pericope. Ooh. <laughs> you must go to Sugarland Bible Church to get that cutting edge information. But this whole pericope or paragraph is one of the most controversial paragraphs in the whole Bible, which we haven't gotten to yet. And yet, because we know what the word save means, we already know how to interpret James 2, 14 through 26. Because look at verse, slip over a chapter, look at verse 14 of chapter 2. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but has no works, can that faith save him? Now, Reformed theology will tell you that what that means is if you don't have enough works in your life, you never had faith to begin with. You're unsaved. And if you believe that, ideas have consequences. You're going to spend your whole life wondering, how many works do I have to have? So you're not going to have any assurance of salvation. And they will quote this over and over and over again. In fact, in Reformed theology, to be honest with you, it's almost like James chapter 1 doesn't even exist. I mean, if Reformed theology was going to come out with their own study Bible, it would start with chapter 2. They come, they, no one tells you what's going on in chapter 1. But chapter 1 tells you what save means. Save, as we just saw, is not first tense salvation, but what? Middle tense. So when James says, can such a faith save him? He's not dealing with, are you a Christian or are you not a Christian? Reformed theology will tell you that. He's dealing with, are you an effective Christian? You follow? Are you a growing Christian? Because the word save is not a technical word. It doesn't always mean the same thing every time it's used. It means different things depending on the context. And when James uses the word save, he's not talking about Trusting Christ for salvation. John's gospel will tell you all about that, by the way. But James isn't talking about that. James is a, the, the pre, presupp, presupposition of James is that his whole flock that he was the pastor of that's now scattered, so he knew them all personally, that they're all saved. They're already Christians. So he's using the word save, not in the first tense sense, but in the second tense uh, sense. 
So we are supposed to receive God's word. And then once I receive God's word, what do I do with that? Well, I'll just do the three S's. I will sit, soak, and sour. Right? Three S's. Sit, soak, and sour. But that is not what James says. James says, once you receive the word, now you need to become a doer of the word. So you'll notice that receiving the word is, is very important. I mean, you can't be a doer unless you're a receiver. However, being a receiver is not a last step. People that think it's a last step, James says, verse 22, delude themselves. It's not a last step receiving, it's a first step. So notice what he says there in verse 22. Very famous verse. Most people, some, a lot of people have this one memorized. But prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers. Famous verse. But what does the rest say? Who delude themselves. Why does it say that? What's the deception? The deception, and I hate to say this, but this is a big deception in our kind of circles. In our kind of church where we stress the teaching of the Bible. And the subliminal message that can be unintentionally communicated is if you hear the Bible and study the Bible, that makes you spiritual. So the end goal is studying the Bible, because you guys are stressing it, so that must be the end goal. And James is saying, if that's what you think, then you've deceived yourself. Or you're in a state of delusion. You think you've arrived at a certain level of spirituality or practical righteousness, but you haven't. Because God never intended his word just to be heard. He intended it to be obeyed. Jesus, and I'll close with this, said this very, very clearly in John 13, verse 17. Where he said in the upper room... If you know these things to the disciples, you are blessed if you what? If you do them. That's very clear. Jesus never said the blessing comes from knowing. That's the Bible church deception. Not that we're trying to communicate that message, but that gets unintentionally communicated sometimes. We th people think they're blessed just by hearing. That's not what James says. That's not what the Lord said in the upper room. Blessing comes from doing. You are blessed in the Christian life when you start to apply what you've learned. You are blessed in the Christian life when knowledge, gnosis, turns into what? Wisdom. Or Sophia. You're not blessed with Gnosis, but you're blessed with Sophia. Gnosis means knowledge, Sophia means wisdom. But here's the trick you can't have Sophia unless you have what? Gnosis. But Gnosis was never intended to be just Gnosis. Because doesn't Paul say, knowledge, what does he say? Where am I going? 1 Corinthians 4, 6, knowledge, somebody said it, puffs up. But love, that's practice, what? Edifies. So if the end game is just the accumulation of knowledge, and there are churches that are like that. Uh, I've been in Bible churches like that. I've also been in denominational churches like that, where it's a bunch of people that... Goodness gracious, how do you fit all their heads in the same room? They're so proud of what they know. Well, James is saying, if that's our condition, then we're deluded. So, I'm going to do something really abnormal. I'm going to stop on time tonight. So, let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your truth, grateful for your word, grateful for how practical it is. Just help us... Uh, 
as we're trying to learn these life lessons from your word, you know, not having just, oh, we've done James, but actually this is like life changing to us from this point on. We ask that you'll do that great work. We ask these things in Jesus name and God's people said, amen. If you got to pick up your young ones, your, your costumed young ones.